Maya Koff. I go to school at the University of Mississippi and I am definitely an animal lover. I'm a vegetarian. I grew up in Arcata and I was a volunteer here at Pisciplary Park Zoo. The Conservation Advisory Committee is made up of scientists and community members and zoo staff um, and we do a lot for um, bringing together uh, conservation ideas that can both help the zoo and help animals outside the zoo. So as Christine mentioned, any donations that you give go towards our conservation grants. And our cycle is just starting up, so our um, if you know of anyone who's doing some interesting work and is looking for a little bit of money, uh, we uh, will review conservation grant applications at the end of January. January 31st is our due date. And uh, we support conservation, field conservation efforts. Uh, for, zoo, for animals that might be here at the zoo, but also animals outside the zoo. We've supported uh, humble State graduate students and all the way to folks working on sea turtles on the coast of Nigeria. So you can see all that on the zoo's website, all the projects that we've supported. We've given away tens of thousands of dollars in this conservation, and that's really exciting. The other thing we do is offer these community lectures, and I'm part of the group that organizes these lectures, and I'm so happy that we were able to invite Maya tonight, and uh, I want to speak less now about me and more about Maya. So, as many of you know, Maya is a humble native. She came through up through this community, and I really enjoy it. What I wanted to mention about these community lectures is I love bringing the community together to hear about what folks are doing in our community. So we've had some agency professors, we've had some agency professionals, and they talk about conservation that's going on right here in your backyard. But I also like that we have people from our community speaking about work that they're doing outside of our community and bringing it back here. So that's really what Maya represents. Um, she was uh, came through the zoo volunteer program as a youngster and spent time here at the Sequoia Park Zoo and then went on to get her degree in biology at Willamette University in uh, Oregon. And she, I was talking to her before the, before the, uh, before this presentation is about to begin, really created her own project uh, to look at this symbiosis in sloths. And so I'm really excited to hear about that. She is a master's student candidate now, well she's a master's student candidate now at the University of Mississippi and she does this work in Costa Rica on sloths and she's going to tell us all about it. And I thank you so much for talking to our community. Thank you for coming. So I will be talking today about my research on sloths and the many symbionts that live and grow on sloths. First, I'd like to thank the Sequoia Park Zoo. Uh, I've been here since I was in diapers. Uh, and I even had a birthday party here. And then I was in the zoo crew volunteer program. So it's really been a place where I've enjoyed learning about animals and it's fueled my passion for wildlife research. I appreciate being back here in a more professional fashion now. You may have heard of sloths in movies like Zootopia, where we have Flash the Sloth at the DMV, or maybe Sid the Sloth from Ice Age, he's a ground sloth, or perhaps Snook the Sloth from a PBS show. Or maybe you saw this commercial where the sloth is drawing, playing Pictionary, not doing so well. <laughs> but these sloths aren't always the most accurate depictions. So these are the six species of sloths that are in the wild, and they live from Central America, from Guatemala, down through much of South America. And there's two types of sloths. There are three-fingered sloths, which are the four on the left here. And then there's two-fingered sloths, which are the two on the right. And there's a couple main differences between these two types of sloths. First, the three-fingered sloths are diurnal, so they're awake during the day. They obviously have three fingers. Um, and I say fingers instead of toes because all sloths have three toes on their hind limbs. It's the number of fingers on their forelimbs that differ. And so that's why I say fingers. It makes a little more sense to me. Um, so yeah, the two-fingered sloths, they've got those two fingers on their forelimbs. They are nocturnal. So they are generally only awake at night. The two-fingered sloths are larger. Um, they have a more varied diet because they have pseudo-canines. So they have sharp teeth that allow them to eat sometimes even eggs, uh, some fruits. But generally, sloths eat leaves. They're called arboreal folivores, meaning they live in trees, and they eat leaves. 
So the three-fingered sloths eat exclusively these. There's four species of three-fingered sloths, and they display what's called sexual dimorphism. And so you can see that here on this sloth. He has a nice big stripe on his back, and that indicates that he's a male. It's not really clear why they have that stripe, especially because the two-fingered sloth relatives don't have any sort of sexual dimorphism. So it's a really interesting fact about them. Um, and most sloths are doing okay in terms of conservation, but the pygmy three-fingered sloth, which is this little one in the top here, uh, is critically endangered. There's only about 75 of them left, and they're only on a small island off the coast of Panama. <coughs> This is the maned sloth here. It's got this nice mane, and it is vulnerable. It's found in rainforests in Brazil, and due to habitat loss, it is considered vulnerable. So you also probably have heard the sloths are lazy. Um, I think of them as more of a perfect example of energy efficiency. And so uh, they are the slowest mammals in the world, but that doesn't mean that they're lazy. So they actually have the perfect adaptation to avoid predators. Because they're slow and they have this slow metabolism, they don't move much in the trees, and so they go undetected by predators. No one can really see them because they blend in with the trees, the leaves, and the bark. Um, and so it's really not considered lazy as much as a perfect adaptation for them to survive. And before I get into sort of my research, I'd like to go over just some fun facts about sloths. They're so popular in the media nowadays, and everyone seems to uh, just enjoy seeing pictures of sloths and learning some fun facts. So we'll go through a couple of them real quick. So you may not know that sloths are really great swimmers. We have a couple examples here. There's a pygmy, three-fingered sloth, and Hoffman's two-fingered sloth. They will swim to get from one habitat patch, so a good tree, to another good patch of trees. Um, the pygmy three-fingered sloth lives in mangroves, and so it actually has to swim to get to other trees. Um, but they're actually better at swimming than being on the ground. They're much faster. Their lifespan is 25 to 40 years, depending on the species. They are solitary, so they don't spend time with other sloths in the wild when it's their mating, or they're taking care of a baby. So these babies, they only give birth to one baby at a time. They keep that baby on them for up to a year, so the mom has a lot of parental care. Here's the whole thing. So the mom holds on to it until it gets pretty big, and then it's off on its own. <coughs> that sloth's name is Dumbo. <laughs> so as I mentioned before, they eat leaves, but often they will eat some other things as well to supplement their diet. They actually have nine cervical vertebra, which those are your neck vertebra, and they use those extra vertebra to be able to look around, scan for predators, even while they're hanging upside down, they can almost turn their head all the way around. They only defecate and urinate once a week, and we'll talk about this a little more later, but it's really interesting, they come all the way down to the base of a tree to defecate, so really strange behavior. They actually only sleep for 10 hours a day, <coughs> It's a misconception that they sleep all the time. They're just resting when you see them sitting there not moving. Um, so I sleep about 10 hours a day, so um, I guess you could call me soft, lazy, or just energy efficient. Um, and also they're very flexible, so they have to be, they move from one tree to the next in the canopy, so they have to be really flexible. And they actually lack the facial muscles to change their expression. So you often see sloths with that kind of dopey smile, and that's because they don't have muscles in their face to change. So you can't tell when a sloth is stressed out because they always have that facial <laughs> So this is a tree showing the closest relatives of sloths. And so in this big super order of organisms, we see that the closest relatives of sloths are actually armadillos and anteaters. And this might seem a little bit strange, but you can tell they're related because of those big claws. And armadillos and anteaters have those big claws for opening termite nests and ant nests and eating those little critters, whereas sloths have adapted to use those big claws to hold on to branches and climb. So you can see in the suborder of Bolivara, we've got the two groups, the two-fingered sloths and the three-fingered sloths. 
The red ones are extinct organisms, so those are ground sloths. And then the blue ones are the ones that I study. If we zoom in, we've got the three-fingered sloths, like the brown-throated three-fingered sloth. We'll see this guy a lot in the presentation today. And that pygmy three-fingered sloth, two-fingered sloth. We've got Hoffman's two-fingered sloth, Linnaeus's two-fingered sloth. Um, and what's really interesting about these two groups of organisms is they're about as closely related as us and monkeys. So they're kind of like cousins. Um, they diverged from each other about 40 million years ago. And so while they have kind of the same behavior, they're both really slow, they eat similar things, they're actually not that closely related. And so that's called convergent evolution. It's a really interesting aspect about these sloths. Sloths have always been one of my favorite animals, and so I really wanted to study them, to learn more about them, to pursue questions I've always had about their ecology and their behavior. Um, and they're really intriguing, and they have a lot of open avenues for ecological research, and so studying them was kind of a no-brainer for me. So why study sloths? Well, one reason is that they have that slow metabolism, so that a really interesting characteristic that we can learn a lot from. Their role in the ecosystem is largely unknown. And so in these pictures here, you can see a sloth and a bird, which is a brown jay. And the brown jay is actually eating insects off of the sloth. And so we know that there's that interaction where birds will actually eat some of those insects off of sloths. But much of the other interactions a sloth might be having with its environment are really unknown. So they also have that unusual evolution I just talked about, where they are closely related to anteaters and armadillos, but they eat something completely different. So they don't eat ants or termites, which seems a little bit strange. And then also they have a very unusual ecology. So I will be talking a lot today about the hair symbionts, so the things living and growing in a sloth's fur. So I really find interesting the many organisms growing on sloths, and that's what I'll be talking about in the lecture today. So they have algae, fungi, and cyanobacteria growing in their fur, which makes them a really unique mammal. Also, their behavior and their metabolism are extremely strange in the mammal realm, and so that's why I study them and find them really intriguing. So a little bit of a background about what a symbiosis is, what a mutualism is, so a symbiosis is a persistent physical interaction between two species. They could be living with each other, or they could be just interacting frequently. Whereas a commensalism, when one of those organisms is benefiting, the other is not. So it's two different species, one is gaining a benefit, the other is just not getting any benefit, but it's not being harmed either. And then a mutualism is when both of those species are benefiting. And so mutualisms are often considered for nutrition, protection, or transportation. And so one example of a nutrition and a protection mutualism is in a coral reef, where coral have a type of algae in them, and the algae provide a sort of nutritional benefit to the coral, and the coral provides a protection benefit to the algae. We have an example with a mongoose and a warthog, where the warthog has insects on it that are parasites, things on the ticks, and the mongoose will go and eat all of those organisms off of the warthog, and they get a nice meal out of it, and then the warthog gets uh, less parasites. So they're both benefiting, so that's a mutualism. With the sloth, it's really not clear right now if the organisms in their fur are mutualisms or commensalisms, so we'll talk about that in a minute. So the symbionts we'll be talking about today are fungi, which is living and growing on their fur and on their skin. There's arthropods, there is algae, and then there's bacteria. The algae is really interesting to me, and it's very unique on sloths because only a couple other mammals have algae. And one of those mammals is a polar bear in zoos, and only in zoos because when they're in zoos, they interact with warmer water that they wouldn't find in their normal Arctic habitat. And so that warmer water has a lot of algal growth and the algae can infiltrate their hollow hair. 
make them turn green. That only happens in zoos. And then we've got manatees, which are also a mammal. They don't have fur like land mammals do, but they also have algae growing on them. Um, but sloths are really the only mammal that has algae in their fur that's natural, in their natural environment. So if we start with the fungi, as I mentioned, it can grow on their skin. And here's a healthy brown-throated three-fingered sloth. Here is a sloth with a fungal infection. And this is Merlin. He is a adult male three-fingered sloth. Um, and he has a severe fungal infection where it creates these scabs on their skin and then it kind of rips their hair out as it falls off. So it's gotta be painful for them. It exposes their bare skin to parasites. It's just not a good scenario for the sloth. And then it also grows in their hair. And this is a normal, kind of the back of the head of a two-fingered sloth. You see that nice green growth. Here's the back of the head of a sloth with some fungal overgrowth. So this is black fungi growing in the hair. But not all fungi is bad. And there's actually a study that showed that there are many species of fungi in sloth hair that have antimicrobial, antimalarial, even anti-breast cancer properties. So those are benefits to us, and they might also be providing benefits to the sloth in some way. So the arthropods that are found on sloths include sloth moths, and that's that top picture there. They live on sloth fur, and we'll talk about them more later on, but they can be um, in large abundance on a sloth. There can be upwards of 100 moths on a single sloth. Then we've got sloth beetles. These kind of live fur down in the fur. They're in the same family as the dung beetles. And then, of course, there's ticks. Um, that's a picture I took of a fully engorged tick there at the bottom. It's about the size of a quarter um, that we pulled off of a sloth. We aren't really sure at this point what diseases they might be transmitting to sloths. But as I mentioned with fungi, not all arthropods are bad. Maybe some of these are providing some benefit to the sloth. Maybe they're commensals, um, but it's something to definitely do research on in the future. So one question I have is why do sloths have these symbionts in the first place? So they have a really unique hair structure. And the brown-throated three-fingered sloth on the left here, that's Aladdin. He's the first sloth I caught with my study. But they have this hair structure that kind of looks like a carrot. And so they have cracks that are transverse that are coming in from the sides of the hair. And as they age, those cracks get deeper. So in that photo, the microscope photo, you can see that on the bottom is a young sloth. And as the sloth ages, it gets older, those cracks develop and get deeper. With two-fingered sloths, their hair structure is a little bit different. It looks more like a churro. So they have vertical grooves. <laughs> And it's known that the three-fingered sloth hair kind of swells and absorbs water, and that promotes algal growth. With the two-fingered sloth hair, it doesn't swell like the three-fingered sloth hair does, but it's my hypothesis that those grooves are there for a reason, and that they do help promote microbial growth in some way. They also have suspensory posture, so that means they hang upside down a lot of the time. And so that allows the water to be trapped in the hair on their back. <clears throat> and their backs are actually where we see most of the microbial growth. So it makes sense that the water and this hair swelling and staying moist is what's promoting the algae to colonize the hair. And we know that algae is at the base of the food web in many systems, like in ocean ecosystems. <clears throat> and so perhaps the back of a sloth is an ecosystem and the algae is at the base of that ecosystem. So it's providing food for other organisms like the arthropods that are living on a sloth. So another question we have is, is the algae sloth interaction a mutualism? And historically, it's been thought to provide a camouflage benefit for the sloth. And you can see they are very green and they do blend in with their background. But when sloths are brown, they also blend in very well. So they blend in with the trunks of trees because they're always holding on to the trunks. They're not holding on to the leaves. Um, so they blend in with those trunks. They also look like ant nests and dead leaves, termite nests. 
Um, so that's one thing that kind of counters this idea that it's camouflage benefit. Um, but there's truly no evidence for this camouflage benefit in the first place. No one's done a study on it. And sloths are only green for half the year. They're green during the rainy season when their hair is moist and it promotes algal growth. During the dry season for six months of the year, they're brown. Um, and it's not clear if the microbiome, which is that group of organisms growing in sloth hair, is changing depending on the wet versus the dry season. And the sloth microbiome is growing on their backs, as I mentioned, so it's where the water is accumulating on their back. And they're hanging upside down, so it would make sense that the algae would grow on their stomach too because their predators are things like harpy eagles flying overhead, so they want to have green on their bellies too to blend in with the green below them, uh, but they don't have that. So that doesn't really support this camouflage benefit theory. There's a harpy eagle. They're pretty incredible, huge birds. They can just easily pick up a sloth and carry it off. So there's also a proposed three-way mutualism with sloths, and this involves their strange defecation behavior. So I said I'd get back to this, here it is. So they climb down to the base of the tree once a week, and in that process, it's thought that they're taking a big risk because they put themselves in danger of predation when they're on the ground. And so they came up with this proposed three-way mutualism to kind of explain why they do this behavior. So the algae you can see growing on their hair, it benefits by having a preferred place to grow. It gets the sunlight easily because the sloth is in the canopy of the trees. It gets the moisture. Um, it also gets nutrients from the moths because when the sloth moths defecate and die in the sloth fur, they provide nutrients for the algae to grow. The moths benefit in this scenario because they have a preferred place to lay their eggs. So they actually lay their eggs in the sloth feces at the base of the tree. Once they emerge from the egg and become a moth, they fly back up to a sloth in the canopy of the tree. And then the sloths benefit um, because, well, it's thought that they eat the algae from their fur and get a nutritional benefit. And they did find that two of the 12 sloths in their study had algae in their stomach contents. But sloths don't lick themselves. So they're not like a cat. They don't go around licking their fur, and probably for good reason. There's probably harmful fungal and bacterial species in their fur that they don't want to ingest. Um, and there's not been a comprehensive environmental survey, so looking at whether or not the algae growing on sloths might also be growing on the barks of trees, leaves, and so maybe they're getting the algae in their stomachs by eating it off of the leaves and things that they're consuming from the environment. Um, but thus, we don't know if it's a mutualism between sloths and your algae, or if it's simply a commensalism. Some other hypotheses I have about why sloths do this strange bathroom behavior and why they have algae in the first place are that they defecate on the ground to be quiet. So their whole lifestyle is kind of surrounded by this idea that they need to go undetected. Because they're so slow, they've evolved to have the slowest metabolism of all mammals, they need to be quiet. And so if they were to defecate from the tops of trees, and after a week they have up to a third of their body weight in urine and feces, and if that were to drop to the floor of, of the rainforest, it might make a lot of noise and attract predators. So that's one hypothesis for why they go to the base of the tree. There's some other hypotheses out there, like maybe they need to eat soil while they're on the ground to supplement their diet of just leaves, um, but we don't often see them eating soil off the ground. So. Um, another idea for why they are as they are is that maybe they're camouflaging as ant nests. And so there's a lot of ant nests in the tropics that look like a hanging sloth. They're brown, they hang from a branch of a tree, and often when I'm trying to find a sloth while I'm down there, I mistake an ant nest for a sloth, for a sloth for an ant nest. So it might make sense that they're camouflaging like that instead of um, like the, <coughs> of the tree itself. Also, the algae might be protecting the sloth from harmful insects. 
And so this tree here in the photo is a Cecropia tree. It's the brown fern of three-fingered sloth's favorite tree. Um, and you can see them in them all the time. But this tree has a mutualism of its own, where it has these aggressive Azteca ants that live in the tree, and they protect the tree from things like uh, birds and monkeys that are trying to eat the fruits of the tree and the leaves of the tree. But sloths don't seem to be bothered by these Azteca ants that are biting all of these other animals. Sloths just go on their merry way and eat as much as they want, and they don't seem at all bothered by the ants. And so maybe the algae is producing some sort of compound that's deterring the ants. And then lastly, maybe the algae is protecting the sloth from those harmful fungal infections. So sloths like Merlin that get that fungi on their skin, maybe there's certain types of algae that are able to produce compounds or that balance out the ecosystem on a sloth and protect it from an overgrowth of those harmful fungi. So onto my particular research. So I study in Manuel Antonio, Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is where that star is. I studied on the Pacific Coast side of the country. And I chose this location because it's where the Sloth Institute is located. So the Sloth Institute is a research and rehabilitation facility that I collaborate with. Um, it was founded about three and a half years ago by a woman named Sam Troll, and they rescue and rehabilitate a lot of injured, orphaned and sick sloths of both the Hoffman's two-fingered sloth and the brown throated three-fingered sloth. And they have a lot of great volunteers that are able to help me catch and track sloths. <coughs> so I couldn't do it without them. They're a really great organization that I'm able to partner with. And so the process that I go through is I catch a sloth. This is one of the great volunteers with the Sloth Institute, Kate, who is catching the sloth, and the way we catch them is we either wait for them to come to the ground once a week, um, which is a really tedious process, and we're usually sitting out there for months waiting. Um, and there's a couple other ways we can catch them. I'm able to tree climb, but that can often be challenging because they're on these tiny branches that don't hold my weight, or we can use a large ladder. But generally, waiting for them to come to the ground, we let them do their business, and then we catch them. They do have very sharp claws, and so we have to curl their little claws under like this, hold them close, and they have very strong <laughs> tendons because they hold <laughs> onto the tree branches. Um, even after they die, you can see a sloth still holding onto a tree branch because those tendons lock into place. So we're very careful to close their claws. They can't open them this way very well, um, so as long as you have them closed, you're okay. But they have four arms or limbs, and so it's sometimes challenging. We bring a blanket and we try to have them hold on to that. We also use soft-sided carriers, like for cats or dogs. We're able to put them in those and transport them that way. Once we've caught them, we bring them to a small laboratory facility. This is the back of a brown bird 300 sloth. You can see it's a male because of that stripe. And I take a hair sample from the back of the head and the shoulder. We also do a full exam on the sloth, and Sam started the Sloth Institute, has a lot of experience um, taking blood samples and seeing if the sloth is healthy. If it needs any medical attention, we provide that sloth with that medical attention, and if it's not ready to go back into the wild, like for example, when we caught Merlin, he had that severe fungal infection. So he had to stay in our care for a little bit longer to get treated. But generally, they're healthy. We give them a tracking collar. These are VHF tracking collars which means that I go out with an antenna, which I'll show in a minute, and listen for beeps and follow the direction of the loud beeps until I find the sloth. And you can see on this little guy here, that's the antenna on the sloth itself. Um, these tracking collars are less than 3% of the sloth's body weight, and they really don't harm the sloth at all. Here you can see, these are those soft-sided carriers that we transport them in. Um, and we return them back to the tree where we caught them, so they go on their merry way. We usually only have them in our care for 30 minutes or less to do the exam, take a hair sample, and then they're free to go. And the reason why we put tracking collars on them is not only to get information about their movements and what they're eating, but also so that I can get multiple samples from them from multiple times in the year. 
So this is Kate again. So we go out into the rainforest. That's that big antenna I was talking about. So she has a tracking box around her neck or a receiver. Um, and we use that big antenna. It tells us where the sloth is by increasing the, the sound or the, the beeps um, when you're facing the sloth. So you spin around in a circle and where it's loudest, then you move that direction, do it again. <laughs> And sometimes, because it's a rainforest, it's really dense. So that's why we bring machetes with us to cut through um, the dense rainforest. Um, and often, because sloths are way up in the canopy and they're camouflaged, you find the tree that the sloth is in, but you still can't see the sloth. So <laughs> then you have to wait and see if it'll come out. If not, you, at least you know it's there. And if it's going to come down to the base of the tree, then you'll see it. So you can kind of sometimes wait around, or you can go track it. So the first aim of my research is to understand if the algae on the sloth is also found in the environment, so like on the barks of trees and on the leaves. And also I'd like to understand if the hand-raised sloths at the Sloth Institute are able to acquire that algae from the environment, so that goes hand in hand, um, because it's really interesting when sloths are in human care, they don't seem to have many of those symbionts in their fur kind of depends on when they went into human care and how long they were with their mother, um, but we would like to know if they're able to get that uh, microbiome on their hair from the environment instead of just from their mom. And then also we'd like to know if the microbiome on sloth hair changes depending on if it's the wet season or the dry season. So as I mentioned, I tree climb. That is me way up in that tree. Um, I use a single rope climbing technique, um, which I learned the summer before grad school in order to prepare for this project. Um, I go up into the canopies of trees and I scrape the bark and I take a leaf sample. Um, that way I can do uh, some analysis on those samples to figure out what microorganisms are living on those samples. Um, I also sometimes am able to catch sloths using this method, but it's incredibly challenging to hang from a rope try to grab all four limbs of a sloth, <laughs> not <at> all, <laughs> not drop the sloth, and the sloth often by the time I'm up in the top of the tree has moved somewhere else. So that doesn't often work, but I try. So with these microbiome surveys, with the environmental samples, so the tree bark and the leaf samples, I do metagenomic sequencing. So that's just a fancy way of saying doing DNA barcoding. So we're figuring out all of the types of DNA, whether they're bacteria, um, cyanobacteria, fungi, algae, and all the different species that are there. And so then we can compare that to the sloth microbiome. So that's the, the stuff that's on the sloth hair. And so with the sloth microbiome, I also do a culturing technique. So that means growing these organisms on media. And so in these photos, you can see these are petri dishes and I actually just put the hair on this media, which has all the nutrients, the algae, and cyanobacteria, and fungi might need to grow. And then I separate all the different species out until you have just one species by itself. Um, and this is the first time anyone has tried to grow the algae and cyanobacteria on a sloth. And so it's really exciting. We've already discovered 16 new species of cyanobacteria um, because no one had ever looked for cyanobacteria before. They were only looking for algae. Um, so it's really exciting to kind of fill in this picture of what's on a sloth and really what's going on in that ecosystem. Um, and I'll also be doing metagenomic sequencing on the sloth hair as well as on their fecal matter. And so as we mentioned earlier, they have um, algae in their stomach contents sometime. And the way they figured that out is they pumped their stomachs. Um, I don't really want to do that to a sloth. It's really stressful for them. So we just take fecal samples when it's possible, and we'll be looking to see if any of the algae is passing through their whole system. <clears throat> the second aim of my research is to better understand sloth health. So this is Merlin again. You can see he's progressing quite well with his rehabilitation. He's starting to regrow that hair on his face that he had lost due to the fungal infection. But this is due to a lot of care from the Sloth Institute. We were giving him baths every two days for about four months to remove all of that fungi from his skin. And of course, everything with sloths is slow, so throwing their hair back is slow. 
um, but he will be back in the wild soon. He also had a eye infection last year that we treated him for. He's a wild sloth, but he keeps coming back because of <laughs> health issues, so we just keep helping him out. Eventually, he'll be healthy enough to go back to the wild, but we were tracking him, and thankfully, because we were tracking him, we were able to detect that fungal infection and get him the care he needed. So they have those fungal infections. They also have a lot of lung issues, so they get the fungi in their lungs as well. They get bacterial infections in their lungs, pneumonia really easily. As you can imagine, in the tropics, it's really humid. There's fungal spores just floating around in the air, and so these sloths are just inhaling them. And when they're young, one of the primary causes of mortality in young sloths is these infections in their lungs. And then also they have many heart issues, which is interesting. So this is a little sloth named Hermy. Unfortunately, he passed away due to congenital heart failure. Um, and it's really hard to, de de to detect these issues with sloths because they don't change their facial expression, they don't really change their behavior because they're already slow and just sitting around. So it's really hard to figure out what's going on with them, what's wrong with them. Um, and so one thing that might help is sequencing the sloth genome. Um, and specifically the brown-throated three-fingered sloth genome. So those are the guys that have the slowest metabolism of all the species of sloths and of all mammals. Um, and just like sequencing the human genome, this might be helpful in understanding interesting things about our health, developing new drugs or ways to help the sloths in the future. It'll help us understand more about their metabolism and their thermal regulation. So that just means how they regulate their body temperature. And sloths are different in that they don't really change their body temperature. They let the environment change their body temperature, like more like a reptile. So they actually exhibit basking behavior where they go up and they bask in the sun to get warm. When they're cold, they just curl up in a ball and try to stay warm that way. But they don't really regulate their own temperature. What's the size of that baby like compared to your hand? Or? It's about this big. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, so sequencing the genome will help us understand these health issues as well. It might also provide some ideas about co-evolution of sloths and the algae as well, which is something we can talk about afterwards if you're interested, but um, I hope to provide the data to sequence their genome and uh, hopefully better understand these species. So with sloth conservation, they have a lot of threats, and some of these threats are due to deforestation. So of course, a sloth needs high canopy coverage to be able to move around. It eats the leaves, it travels amongst the trees, and so when the forest is cut down, the sloth loses its home and its food, so it's, it's not a happy sloth. Um, when there's no trees to move from one space to another, they will travel on power lines, and many of the power lines in the tropics are not insulated, and so they will get electrocuted. Um, when they're on the ground, they're susceptible to dog attacks, and of course there's many stray dogs in those tropical countries there's, of course, roads, and as I mentioned, sloths are very slow on the ground, much slower than they are in trees. They aren't actually able to push themselves up. They can't stand, can't really even crawl. It's more like a sprawl on your belly, reach and grab sort of maneuver. Um, and unless the cars see the sloth and stop and help it across the road, they're often hit by cars. And then there's this really tragic industry called the sloth selfie trade, in which people will actually down trees that sloths are in, remove the sloth, and then go to a tourist place and sell pictures with that sloth to tourists. And sloths usually only live about six months after they enter this trade because, of course, they look happy, they look fine, but they get really stressed out, they get stomach ulcers, um, they get parasites, they're not getting the nutrition they need, so they don't last for very long. And one example of that, this is a sloth named Tilly. My family and I were actually traveling through Costa Rica this past summer, and some man approached our car and said, hey, you want to take a picture with my pet sloth? And of course, I got really upset <laughs> and, and I speak Spanish, so I just kind of like went off in Spanish and told him it's illegal and that it's horrible for the sloth and all, and we drove away. And 
Luckily, I know a lot of people in Costa Rica and was able to report it to the government, and they confiscated this sloth, and she's now in the care of the Sloth Institute, and will soon be released back to the wild. Um, but when she was <laughs> when she was in the care of this this man, uh, she had her fingernails painted, um, so we removed that. Uh, she had three parasites, digestive parasites, and she was extremely emaciated. Um, but she's doing really well now, and hopefully we'll be able to track her and make sure she's doing well in the wild. So ways to help with sloth conservation. You can, of course, support organizations like the Sloth Institute um, that do on-the-ground sloth rehabilitation and conservation work. You can also support sloth research uh, and sloth education. So you can share these facts that you learned today with your neighbors and friends, <coughs> try to dispel some of these misconceptions about sloths and teach them how you can help sloths. And of course, rainforest conservation is essential because if we don't protect the rainforest, we don't protect the sloth. And so much of the rainforest is being cut down um, and cattle is now on that land. And when you remove sloths, which are the largest um, biomass mammal, or they have the most biomass of any mammal, in a rainforest ecosystem, and you replace that with cows, um, it has a more detrimental effect than you might think. So this shows that a sloth only produces a very minimal amount of CO2 into the atmosphere, whereas a cow produces a lot of emissions through both ends into the atmosphere. And so it's not only that you're protecting a sloth when you're protecting the rainforest, but you're also helping minimize the effect um, on climate change. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of people to thank for this, but especially Sam Troll, who runs the Sloth Institute, and all of the volunteers at the Sloth Institute who helped me catch and track sloths. And then my advisor, Dr. Connor Kong, and my committee members, Dr. Ballinger and Dr. Jackson. shaped leaves, that's their favorite. And so generally um, they have like three trees that they kind of switch between within a couple week period. Um, but usually at least one of those trees is a cecropia tree. But they will eat about 20 species. And then the two-fingered sloths have about 100 different species that they'll eat. So they don't really have a preference. Yeah. How do sloths find partners? So it's really interesting. Well, I'm just yeah, the females, so they're solitary, so they're all in different trees, but the females will emit a high-pitched scream. And when that happens, all of the males come from all the surrounding trees as fast as they can. And they actually fight. And so the way that we caught Aladdin, that first sloth that I caught, was he fell from a tree because he was fighting with another male. And so they'll, like, kind of go at each other with those claws, they'll bite each other until they fall from the tree. Whoever wins gets the female. Do they have um, a certain area that they live in? Do yeah. they go outside of a So they an have area a home range that's about the size of two to three football fields. Um, when they're young, they will disperse, they'll move away from their mom. Or often I've seen that their mom will bring the baby to a new area and kind of drop it off there and then <laughs> So that's how she kind of gets rid of it because she doesn't want it to come back. And so that's like, often we'll track sloths and then one day we'll see it with the baby and then the next week when we find it again, the baby's gone and she was like way off in another area. So we think that she might be trying to help them disperse in that way. Yeah. So the type of algae that has been found on sloths, it's called Trichophilus welkeri, and it's a green algae. And that's the type of algae that's only found on sloths so far. And so I'm trying to figure out if that algae is also found in the environment. And then the types of cyanobacteria, so cyanobacteria is a type of bacteria, but it's green like the algae. And so there's types that are actually found in 
oceans and rivers and lakes as well. And those are types that are responsible for, you know, what algal toxic blooms are that we have around here and the Great Lakes. So the types on sloths are actually those same types found in rivers and lakes and things. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Question. Yeah, in the back. like this little guy here, his name's Keanu. On their back, they have a big stripe, and it's like a big black stripe with some orange fur around it, and that's how you know it's a male. But with the two-fingered sloths, those ones with kind of the piggies now, you can't really tell if it's a male or a female. And so we have to do a thorough examination in the lab to figure out if it's a male or a female. But it's not known how, like in the wild, how they tell between a male and a female. Like, how does a sloth know that's a male or a female? We don't know. Would they give us him more of a screening as a female? But if it's not ready to mate, if it's not ready to mate, then we have no idea. Yeah. So I have a question. Um, what's the gestation period for a sloth? So it depends on the species, but it's six to nine months. Oh. And then they just produce uh, one? one baby. Yeah. It's, Sometimes they'll have two, and if they do have two, generally they abandon one of them because they can't keep both on them. It's just too much weight, they're not able to care for two. So that's often the case. Um, we find sloths where the mom had two, one was abandoned, and then it ends up in a rehabilitation facility. And do they come down to the Nope, they deliver in the tree. Yep. How do you measure the metabolic rate of those sloths? <laughs> so, you know. I'm not actually right. sure. Um, I think they. I'm not sure. Because I know people you could put them on a treadmill with them. Yes. How did you get that sloth in the basket? <laughs> he actually loves that basket. So that's Keanu. He was hand raised by Sam at the Sloth Institute. He's actually ready to be released. So he'll be released in the next few weeks, which is really exciting. Um, but they really like kind of secure places, um, so he'll just climb into that basket on his own. That's his favorite little spot. Do you have some, while you're um, in Mississippi going to school, do you have somebody there that's taking hair samples and continuing sort yeah. of your collection of data while you're not there? Yeah, so Sam is really great. Um, she has her master's in biology, and so she has some research experience, and they do try to do research there as well. And so whenever they catch sloths, they, I left some of my supplies down there and taught her my technique. And so she's able to take hair samples for me as well. So you mentioned to me earlier, you go down in the dry season and the wet season. And you mentioned that they only have the algae in the wet season. Visibly. Visibly, right. So are you, that was my question, right? So are they like harboring it? It's yeah. lower in their fur? It's not green. I guess that's yeah. what you said. It's only green. So I think it goes into a dormant state okay. because when I put hair from the dry season yeah. on a plate, yeah. it almost immediately turns green. Right. Okay. And so it's like in a dry, desiccated state. Right. And then it, once it's wet, so if it rains at all, then within minutes it's green. Yeah. yeah, but it's very possible that like small changes in micro habitats can really change like the microbes in the area. So it's very possible that the ecosystem has a lot of changes. But there is still, because the algae is really stuck on there really well. And so that's still there. It's just kind of dried out. Yeah. I just want to make a, a comment that tonight PBS is airing a nature program in 10 minutes, which oh. is through Sam. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she's alternating with a kangaroo, um, a sloth, and I can't remember what the third animal it is. But that they're koala. Koala. So, oh, it's koala. 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 Koala, yeah. <laughs> They don't really have a favorite. They just eat lots of different kinds. Yes. Uh, how do you tell if a sloth is stressed out if it doesn't change that much? Well, so sometimes a sloth will try to swipe at you, and that's an obvious sign that they're stressed out and feel threatened. Um, the 
they'll try to bite you. But those are really the only signs. If they're like semi-stressed, they aren't going to expend the energy and try to like swipe and fight back at you. So you really can't tell. I mean, Sam probably can tell because she has lived with sloths literally hanging on her 24-7 every day of the year because she raises them. And if you're a human raising a sloth, you have to live with the sloth on you because that's what it's used to in the wild. And so she has sloths just hanging on all the time. <laughs> but, um, so she can probably detect if they're stressed out. But otherwise, it's, it's pretty true. Are they allergic to the ulcers? Yeah, so they get stomach ulcers. And it's not really clear what else um, that the stress might cause, but it's very clear that once they're in human care, that it's not like a human raising a sloth to release it. If it's like a human taking a sloth from the wild, their health just goes down pretty quickly. You said that the, you know, if it burps twins, mm -hmm. that it lets one go. Does the leaves actually provide enough nutrition? Yeah, for, the, for the mama? For the mama, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, sometimes we find mother sloths aren't able to produce enough milk, um, and maybe that's because they're lacking nutrition and they don't have enough to provide for the baby as well as themselves. Um, but generally, they seem to be healthy even when they have a baby, and they have babies pretty much year round. So I've seen even with a mama sloth with a baby on her, a male come and mate with her. And so I think it's part of their strategy because uh, babies are susceptible to lung infections and predation. And if they fall from mama sloth, that could be dangerous as well. Um, so they're just reproducing all of the time. And generally, um, the mom seems to be okay, healthy, and be able to take care of the babies. So it's, it is more the weight than the Yeah. Yeah, I mean, once the sloth has been on her for a year, that baby is more than half her size. And so there's no way she could carry two. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. The first one is how fast is that swipe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll demonstrate. So with the three fingered sloth, because they have the slowest metabolism, theirs is pretty slow. It's maybe like that. A two fingered sloth is much quicker. It's more like. <laughs> so the two-fingered sloths, we need at least three people to catch them because they also have those sharp pseudo canines. So they will bite and bite deep, and they will swipe much faster. And so they're very aggressive. They need multiple volunteers to catch them. The three-fingered sloths, I'm able to grab one on my own. You just have to be very careful. <laughs> yes. The second question is, what, what got you interested? So I really like weird animals, like sloths, platypuses, echidnas, flying squirrels, all the really strange ones. And sloths have a lot of interesting questions that I can pursue as a researcher. Um, they're also not way over in Australia, where most of the weird animals are, so they're a little bit easier to study. Um, I really enjoy the tropics, and I speak Spanish, and so um, I love going down there. They're always one of my favorite animals. When I was an undergrad at Willamette University, I expressed my interest in sloth, sloth ecology and behavior to my advisor. Um, he really pushed me to pursue that in grad school. Yeah. Has a sloth ever picked up their own tracking collar before? Um, not that we know of. We have lost a couple of sloths because their tracking collars stopped beeping, and it's possible that it got, it fell off, maybe it fell into water and stopped working, but it's also possible that they fell from a tree and hit a rock, or um, that something came and eat them and ate them, like a, a puma or a jaguar or an ocelot came and maybe damaged the collar. Um, but generally they can't take it off because we screw it on with a little screwdriver and then we tape over that. And they never seem bothered by it. We kind of with the new sloths that are just being released, we make sure they don't have an allergy to it. So if they're scratching at it and they feel like it's itchy or bothering them, then we take it off and we try a different method. Some do have an allergy. 
How much does each tracking collar cost? Uh, about two hundred dollars. GPS tracking collars are about a thousand each. So that's why I have this kind of primitive technology where I have to go around spinning in a circle with this huge antenna. If I had GPS collars, I could just on my phone it would tell me all, where all of the slots were. But I don't have enough funding to buy twenty collars for a thousand dollars each. Uh, when they're allergic to the collars, um, we can try a different material. We can tape over the material. Um, yeah, there's a couple options. Okay, so could it be that they're going to the bathroom on the ground? Could that be a deterrent to their predators? The odor around the foot of the trees kind of like be sort of like, ugh. Or could it be a repellent like um, to them? I'm just curious. Possibly. I mean, generally, if a predator knows the scent of their prey, like they know what the feces or urine smells like, then they know that that prey is around and they're able to find it easier. And so sloths do, when they go to the bathroom, they kind of wiggle their tail. Well, three-fingered sloths, they have a tail. Two-fingered sloths don't. But they both kind of wiggle and dig a little bit of a hole, and then they defecate. And sometimes they even try to cover it up a little bit. So it's like mm -hmm. they're trying to go undetected. Mm -hmm. So nothing sees them or smells them. How long does it take to climb back up the tree? Um, depends on the size of the tree, but generally 10 to 15 minutes. Depends on the species though. Like the two-fingered sloths are much quicker. had those big claws too and some of the caves down in the tropics are because of sloths they actually dug caves um, and sloths actually were one of the ground sloths were one of the only animals that could eat a whole avocado and pass the seed through their system so they would disperse avocado trees and they're one of the reasons why we have <laughs>